Thank you, uh, Corey, and thanks for inviting me for this wonderful debate, um, which I've done before. Uh, so I don't have any disclosures for this unequipoisable topic, uh, except that my wife is a breast surgeon and she talks for Genentech, but I'm not talking about Genentech, so it's irrelevant. Okay, so I could really start with something incredibly boring, which is let's look at the most 2016 meta-analysis of this, which everybody puts their lives into. Uh, and I, I don't want to go into this because really it's, it, it's not equipoise. I mean, you look at this. This is all thoracic surgeons, and then you've got this thing, information center. I have no idea whether it's a radiation oncologist or not. But the bottom line, of course, is that you know surgery is better if you do a lobectomy and it's not better if you do a sublobar resection, which, you know, who knows? But I'm not, I'm not gonna go into that. Uh, what I am gonna go into is that this is a non-resolvable debate, and we can talk about it all day today and call this a debate. This is non-resolvable, there's no answer. Uh, and the problem is because we all are biased. And there is no equipoise, and when there's no equipoise, uh, then you have contamination of each cohort with who you think is gonna do better, and then everything gets screwed up. Now, how do you fight equipoise? I'm not gonna go into this. This, with Jack Roth on the left and Joe Chang on the right, they are the chief proponents of the randomized trial. Two trials put together, one didn't work, one did. Final conclusion, surgery doesn't work very well compared to SBRT in early lung cancer. With about 20 some patients in each of this pooled randomized trial. I'm not gonna go into that. I'm gonna let Charles go into that and say that that's the standard of care. Um, for me though, I won't pick on Charles. I'll pick on Europe, which I love to pick on. So this is, this is Matt Guckenberger. He is one of the leaders in the world with regard to SBRT and how good it is and does these editorials and writes these review articles and has published himself. And I just took the most, one of the most recent ones that he published and I think he makes some good points. And the first point is that SBRT is recommended for patients who are inoperable. Absolutely, I'm not gonna argue with that, whether they're stage one or not. Uh, second thing he says is that if a patient comes to me and says, there ain't no way you're touching me, obviously, let's get a biopsy and go to SBRT. So I have no problems with that either. Uh, the third thing is three studies in a randomized trial were stopped because they couldn't accrue but, you know, there is the combination randomized trial that shows the surgery is not as good as SBRT. Fine. Said I'm not going to talk about that. Let him talk about that. Uh, and then, then comes the important line. The important line is this. Matched paired analyses and studies using propensity scoring matching provide high level of evidence in the absence of randomized control trials. High level of evidence. And then in total, you got 10 such studies, and they all show that SBRT is better than surgery, or at least it's good. I, I, can't, I can't argue with that. But then came this study. This study, which was published from Yale, that actually has a radiation oncologist on it, in which they went to the National Cancer Database. And they looked at all the patients in the National Cancer Database. Uh, that could possibly fit early lung cancer, good performance status, could be matched, uh, and to see how they do looking at the SBRT group versus the surgery group. Now, what's unique about this is that in the National Cancer Database, it scored as to whether the patient is morbid because you have a Charleston dio comorbidity score. And second of all, uh, it's actually listed as whether surgery was not recommended because it was contraindicated. So obviously you knock out all those patients when you do this study. Uh, and this is the way you do the comorbidity. Sorry, you can't read it very well, but that's the Charleston Dio score. It talks about all those nasties that are going to make patients do worse. You had to be zero to get into this study. No comorbidities in the Charleston Dio. 
so that you can go in. Uh, so you started out with a format like this with about 35,000 patients to begin with. And as you go through the get rid of the unresectables and the ones who had to, you know, had to have SBRT because they simply were poor performance, you go all the way down to so your left with 1,781 patients that are, are in the SBRT group, and you've got 13,000 in the lobobacnia group. That, quote, early stage, and you see where the stage is, less than five centimeters, but and no comorbidities, zero, uh, and they were declared that they couldn't be operated on. Uh, here's the data. So on the left, you have all of the patients, the 1,781 that are match propensity for the lung cancers, and notice that, that wonderful early break that, gee, early SBRT looks good, and then something happens significant uh, at five years. And then you look at just the patients, the 235, that refuse surgery, the really good ones, and they refuse surgery, it's 0.01. So it's at five years, and that's also what my point is, five years. Not three years, not two, five years. And another bonus is that those patients that had lobectomies, 12% of them, uh, actually had a lobectomy seven, and, and, were no, and, and were found to have lymph node metastases. Those patients got postoperative chemotherapy and all 16% of those patients in that trial got postoperative adjuvant. And then if you look at SBRT, where there was really minimal nodal sampling, 6%, uh, only 6% received adjuvant chemotherapy. If you look at all the patients and you do a Cox proportionality model, which is really not fair, but I'll bring it up anyway, uh, you find that SBRT has a higher hazard ratio, so essentially surgery is 41% better. Okay, so what does Matt Guggenberger have to say about this? Because look at 2016. Soon as that article comes out, he's going to write an editorial. And what he's going to say about that now, which is a propensity-matched study, large numbers, which he said was high evidence before, now direct one-to-one -one comparisons like this are like comparing apples and oranges. So uh, it's unfortunate that this big trial that was propensity-matched now is apples and oranges. We need to go to something that absolutely is prospective, better than this, and he tells us which one it is. And he says, you go to the Japanese literature. You look at Dr. Onishi's data that has been presented and presented and then is finally published, in which they had patients that they looked at both inoperable and operable prospectively to see how they did. And they all got SBRT. And they were able to define who was going to be inoperable or not. There it is. So here is the publication, 2015. And indeed, over on the left in the box, you see, indeed, what was classified as operable and makes sense as far as the FEV1s and the ECOG status and the age and all that sort of stuff. And on the right, you see the, the format. Uh, and what you're left with is about 65 or 64 patients who are operable. And if you compare the operable to the inoperable patients, you'll see that the age in these patients is pretty high. You've got a lot of patients who are greater than 75. Uh, but also I'd like to point out that the, this group, this trial, has both adenocarcinoma and squamous cell carcinomas in it. Okay. And here are the curves. 54%. You can remember that. Five-year survival. Yes, three-year survival is close to 80%, just like he says. And if you look at the progression-free survival, it's 54.5%. And if you look at the local progression-free survival at three years, it's 70%. But the five-year overall survival is 54%, which is pretty good for a non-surgical-based therapy. And this is comparing the operable to the inoperable. Uh, I'll even give it to Charles that I'm not so sure how good the stratification is because I would have expected a greater separation between these two. But that hurts me, so I'm not going to dwell on that. Um, so 
What does Dr. Guggenberger say? Overall survival in medically operable patients treated with SPR2 is about 80%. And he's right. That's what that data just showed you. At five years, it's 54%. OK, and the National Cancer Database doesn't allow for adequate identification of truly operable patients. Great. So why don't we go back to Japan? We're going back to Japan. At the same time that they were running that trial, the Japanese surgeons were also running a prospective trial looking at the same population to see how those patients do with sublobar resections and segmentectomies and lobectomies. So they had a prospective trial done at the same time. So they could go back to their trial, which is JCOGO 201, seen in red. And there you see some of the differences with regard to the operability criteria. But it's essentially the same population. And they wanted to compare apples to apples. So this time, it's no squamous cell carcinomas. Let's just look at the adenocarcinomas. So you're comparing 40 of the patients who are adenocarcinoma to 219 on the diagram that you see on the right. So if you do it without actually propensity matching, you can see there is a real difference in age here. And that's a big problem, 79 versus 62. They're all adenocarcinomas. There's the data on those patients, not really matched. Lobectomy's blue, OK? If you propensity match, though, uh, you've got an age of 75 and 73. Uh, the tumor size is the same. Let's look at the propensity matched curves. Japanese, prospective, Guckenberger's delight. There's the lobectomy. There's SBRT, all Japanese. OK, so more from Dr. Guckenberger. Uh, well, you know, I give it to you that performance status is in the NCDB. Pulmonary function is not. Detailed comorbidity index can be looked at in the NCDB. And he, go, he goes on about other studies that he likes. But there are issues with the NCDB, and I'll be the first one to admit it. It really doesn't capture how severe the medical conditions are. Uh, we don't really know who populated the unhealthy for surgery thing. Was it a primary medical doctor? Was it uh, the surgeon? Was it an uh, a med internist? Was it the SBRT person? I don't know. Uh, it doesn't capture cause of death, which is another important situation that you have to look at here as far as cancer survival. And so you got to look at overall survival. Now, look at the SEER database. SEER database actually does have cancer-specific survival. And when you look at the SEER database and you look at these type of studies, this is a study that was looked at from the Cornell group, tumors that are small. They did two analyses, also propensity matching using a different uh, comorbidity score, the Ellixhauser. What they looked at, first of all, was small tumors and compared small tumors, less than two centimeters, SBRT versus uh, sublobar resection. And they found, God, it looks great until you do the propensity matching. And that's the lower right-hand corner curve where those curves are pretty close together. So sublobar resection versus SBRT is not very good in small tumors. SBRT does pretty well. But if you look at larger tumors and then you do propensity matching, there's the corner curve for the larger tumors in which you're not just limiting yourself to a wedge but you're doing more than that. What is the importance of a wedge? Is a wedge different than a segment or a lobe? Uh, actually, it is. Uh, and if you look at the data from SEER, in which the Sinai group, Wisniewski, who does a lot of these, uh, along with Ken Rosenzweig, again, you've got a radiation oncologist on this trial, from SEER, looking at the same data, what they found is that when you looked at all of the re resections, sublobar, lobectomy, there's no difference between SBRT and lobectomy. But then when you look at segmentectomy, the, the hazard ratio is 1.8 in favor of surgery. So maybe the type of operation, anatomic versus non-anatomic, makes a difference too. There's problems with Sears also, and we all know what that is. So what about comparative effectiveness, a buzzword these days? If you do comparative effectiveness uh, and you're looking to see you know, how good something is, this study from Dr. Yu 
when he was at Yale, again having Roy Decker on it, who's a radiation oncologist, as well as the thoracic surgeons. They looked at the timing of morbidity and mortality with SBRT and surgery. Uh, and they could do this in the SEER database. They chose patients that were older, looked at their comorbidities, and did a two-to-one propensity matching. And what they found is that early on, there's much less morbidity with, with SBRT. But as you get past two years, and you look at the morbidity of SBRT versus surgery, it sort of evens out. If you look at three-month mortality, obviously, SBRT is going to win. But if you then look at long-term mortality, all-cause, uh, it's about the same. But cancer-specific mortality is a little bit different. And depends upon whether the patient is fir infirm or not, or frail or not, it has a good life expectancy. And patients who have a short life expectancy are probably better for SBRT versus those that are going to live longer who should have surgery. Now, the final note is histology. And you, you, what, what would histology have to do with this? Well, histology is going to be important because we all know there's a new adenocarcinoma uh, histo histologic system. And there are different types, acinar, there's lipidic, there's papillary, but then there are the bad actors, micropapillary and solid. And why are they bad actors? Because if you look at the survival curves of looking at AIS, adenocarcinoma in site 2, or minimally invasive adenocarcinoma, they do extraordinarily well. You look at the acinars and the, pa and the papillary, they're in the middle, but then the solids and the, and the, and the micropapillaries do lousy. Now, that's been actually validated in other studies, you can see the red X's and the other X's that are black, solid and micropapillary, have a shorter five-year disease-free survival with surgery. How does that apply here? Well, I mean, we know as surgeons that when we operate on these patients and we do limited resections compared to lobectomy, the lower curves show that the percentage of micropapillary, you get greater chance of recurrence. So you can't do, you really shouldn't do you know, uh, wedge resections on these patients and maybe even not segmentectomies. How does that apply to radiation oncology? Well, uh, here's a paper that was published from the Sloan Kettering Group in which they actually had biopsies that they knew what type of adenocarcinoma it was and then they got SBRT and they had a high risk group and they had a low risk group. And the high risk group was the 32% that you see on the right side that are the micropapillaries and the solid, and the rest of them are compared to the other histologies. And what they found was that the chance of recurrence after SBRT, as well as disease systemically coming back, was different between the adenocarcinoma subtypes. So what does this mean for SBRT on the high-risk patients? Does that mean you really should stage a little bit better before you're going to give them SBRT or think about which, how you're going to treat the patient maybe a little bit differently? I don't know. It's an unanswered question, something to think about. So my observations as an old, decrepit surgeon, still, oper still operating, uh, <laughs> it's more complicated than a simple debate. Timing and longevity of the therapy with regard to complications and mortality must be considered. Age and lung cancer deaths complicate the issue, as well as the type of surgery you are comparing SBRT against. And then, final, and then histologic considerations in adenocarcinoma could influence treatment of at least, or at least mandate a greater need for staging in SBRT cases. And then finally, there is no equipoise, just like when you vote for president. Thanks very much.